Well, Jason, it's great to have you on, on the town hall. Uh, Jason is somebody that if you don't know him, you should get to know him. Uh, Jason Stats, he's a CPA. He sold his firm. He's the founder of Realize. And he's a subject matter expert on many things, one of those being artificial intelligence. Clearly, he's an expert on technology. Uh, Jason is playing a role with us in the Startup Accelerator. And actually, uh, Jason's working on a project uh, with us, uh, CPA.com, related to really uh, thinking about ChatGPT's impact on the profession in finance and accounting. So what we're going to do here, Lisa, is we're just going to we're going to kick off this discussion. We're going to you know this is something we'll be we'll be talking more about. Uh, so Jason, I, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to share related uh, to to your background. No, that's a great intro. Thanks, Eric. Uh, and yeah, happy to be here and talk talk AI and and kind of the goods and the bads that are coming with it. Right, well, Lisa will be part of this discussion as well. So let's um, just kick things off. I don't mean I don't know if every if some people right now, if I looked at our chat, were saying, "What is Chat GPT?" So why don't you give uh, a little bit of an overview on that, and and then talk about some of these different AI models? Yeah. So Chat GPT, I think if there's an analogy to be drawn here, it's it's maybe AI's iPhone moment. It's it's one of the first times that I think most of us came in direct touch with AI in a meaningful way. Chat GPT, um, you know, historically it, it is the fastest growing ever application to a million users. The previous record was TikTok, which took three or four months or something like that. Not sure if that's a good omen or not, yeah. but uh, a ton of people are using it and it's kind of kicked off this whole discussion around AI, but bigger picture, there's actually hundreds of thousands of different AI models out there. And I don't know about you, Eric and Lisa, mm. I could, I probably couldn't count on more than four fingers, how many AI models I know by name. Uh, but they're growing really fast. It's one of those things that's, that's probably going to impact the ways that we work. So cruising through this slide here, the, the big mainstream one that people are talking about, that's got the headlines, it's chat GPT. And that is fundamentally a, a text generation model where you send it a prompt and it effectively continues that text. Based on what you told it, it says kind of what it thinks you want to hear next. And that turns out to be really useful in a bunch of applications, uh, some of them in really startling ways. Mm -hmm. OpenAI announced their newest model uh, about a month and a half ago, and they capped off the, the announcement live stream by saying, we're now going to prepare somebody's taxes with this. Uh, and there, there were a lot of caveats to it and things it will do and won't do, but, but obviously it's just something to be aware of. Um, another type of AI model we're seeing a lot of is text to image. And so that is being able to put in a prompt and generating imagery based on that prompt. Speech to text, actually a really big one. We've had kind of auto captions for quite a while, but the quality of this has gotten way better. Uh, and where this could be really impactful is actually working with people who speak different languages. You can now have almost these live transcriptions to enable better communication uh, cross culturally, and then last, image to text. This is this is something that is particularly mm -hmm. interesting to me. It's the ability of an AI model to understand what it's looking at, and mm -hmm. that becomes particularly powerful when you think about a Chat GPT-like experience that can see your desktop or your browser, or the apps that you use, and understand what's happening there. So if you think about comparing something like this with you know, RPA, robotic process mm -hmm. automation, we've been talking a lot about the last few years. If it can see and understand what's on screen and then help set up automations and take actions with kind of that semantic chat type experience, that could be a really exciting development. Well, well Jason, you know, one thing that is, is interesting is we've talked about a lot of technology triggers over the past decade. I mean, a decade mm -hmm. ago, have, more than that, the cloud and, and then you've you've had you've had blockchain, and now AI has been happening for a moment. I like this you know analogy. Maybe it's the iPhone moment for AI. But at the early stages, you're always digging into the insides of the technology, the text generation, the image to text. But what we're going to get into now is you know how it's applied, the, the yeah. application. So that's just I think just for the community here, sometimes it can even be overwhelming here understanding all of the how behind it, but what 
you know, it's important for the town hall communities to understand the application and how it's going to change uh, if a, a practice management system, an mm -hmm. accounting system, or a tax system. Yeah. Yeah, ultimately, where you're probably going to bump into this stuff every day is in the applications that we use. So to talk through a few examples, um, some some situations where we're going to be running into this more and more, uh, the accounting ledger is a big one. Uh, accounting ledgers today are really rules-based. Classification generally happens based on the rules that you create, which is reliant upon us creating those rules well and actually following through on them. I think what we're going to see through the lens of accounting ledgers is more of that classification being done on an automated basis, but also in a more intelligent way that pulls in additional context, like invoices and receipts, and even things like organizational email. If someone mm -hmm. gets an email confirmation about something, I think we'll see a more kind of intelligent pulling together of all that information in order to classify things in a more helpful way. Uh, big one I'm excited about uh, is, is how it enables our practice management systems. Uh, a couple examples are just vastly improved search, the ability to search organizational email, team chat, you know, meeting transcriptions, uh, the, the actual contents of the files in your file storage system, all from a single search experience. That's going to be really powerful. I know one way folks are using ChatGPT right now is to, to help them craft, uh, you know, email replies in, in a helpful tone. Uh, where mm -hmm. sometimes that can be a challenge. I think generative email inside of your practice management system could even be really valuable. If you think about all the information your practice management system has, that's that's projects, that's files, that's email history. And for it to be able to propose kind of a, a suggested initial reply, even just as a starting point for how you're going to send that reply to a client, that could be really powerful. Um, but that generative stuff could even go as far as generating documents and files. So if, mm. if a client emails you asking for a banker letter and you've got 200 examples of similar banker letters in your file system, that system has enough information to give you a pretty solid head start on what that document ought to look like rather than just building that thing from scratch each time. So Jason, are we months away from that? Or are we years away from that? What's the timeline? Generative email. Uh, I talked with the practice management system yesterday who will have that out by the end of this month. So it's the sort of thing that we're gonna have in our hands pretty quick. Some of the bigger stuff around doing more meaningful things with all of the data that's already in that system, that's gonna be a little bigger of a lift, but realistically, this is all within the next 12 months kind of stuff. Yeah, Jason, I'm here. I mean, what you're talking about right now, just the generative AI to do email answering, to, to write a blog, to you know, put together some marketing package. It's interesting that I mean, yeah, that that's here today, and it's in some ways the the things that you're hearing about online, where doing doing the tax work or doing some uh, complication, com more complicated transactions. You know, ChatGPT sometimes gets it wrong, but when yep. you're using it in this practice management uh, fashion, where you're just going to do a final edit on it. It's you know the the level the level of uh, of complexity or where it needs to be is just different. Yep. Yeah. The quality is much better because it's only ever going to be as good as the context that it knows. ChatGPT is just pulling from the web, so the more right. contextual it gets, the more helpful it is. And just tell them a little bit ChatGPT four, so that people are hearing. You know, you see some yep. examples. It's on the earlier version. So give them give the audience here a little bit of rundown of what does ChatGPT four mean. Yeah, so ChatGPT is, is just a chat interface, and right. behind that are multiple different models. The newest right. model that you've probably heard about is called GPT-4, and right now the only way to get access with that is, is with a paid subscription to ChatGPT. Uh, it's a big improvement over the previous model, which was GPT-3.5. You can use that previous one for free still, but that fourth version is going to be a little more powerful. And what, what content has it scrolled? Uh, more the web, uh, something like a third of the entirety of the web. So it's, it's, a it's a really an unfathomably, unfathomably large volume of in information that it draws on to complete those text generations. So Jason, one of the things that we've talked about is that chat GBT was only current up to 
a particular date. Yeah. Um, what's the what's the latest on that? Yeah. So the models are trained up until September of 2021. Uh, but they've actually have an early access, a, a plugin for chat GPT that can browse the web. So similar actually to what Bing does now is that when you prompt it, it'll pull, you know, the top 10 highest scoring results from web search and then scrape those web pages and marry that information with the response that it would have otherwise given to kind of marry current events with that larger model. Well, I personally, oh, I'm sorry, Eric, real quick. Um, I haven't been able to get access to chat GPT because every time I try, it's busy. I get locked out, and, you know, pushed yeah. to the back of the line. So I've just been playing around in Bard and, okay. um, you know, just helping me write things or yeah. helping me um, pull together information on, let's say, how to drive employee engagement in a remote environment. And it gives you a great list. Or what's the impact of... Uh, um, these uh, generative AI models on a, on the accounting profession. So if you want to just play around and try to figure out what all we're talking about, and you can't get to chat B GPT, you know, you can take a look at BARD, B-A-R-D. Yep. Lots of questions are coming in. Lots of questions. So this, I don't know if everybody's at the beach that's bringing all these questions into us. Uh, so you know, you know, just can we trust AI, you know, generating work products from from other client products, all kinds of all kinds yeah. of issues here. So with great power comes great responsibility. Why don't you, uh, you know, respond to some of these questions that you don't see, but you probably <laughs> can feel. Oh, oh, I've heard them. And they're all good questions. I mean, the so ultimately, there's a question of accountability. You are still accountable for the output. And that, that's that's always been a value of what we provide in the credential and all of that. And it's honestly why accountants are actually well suited to lean into this stuff is we already have the technical review framework to ensure the output is correct. So it's ultimately not a replacement for accountability. Uh, from a security standpoint, a lot of the best practices here are going to be the same. Don't disclose things unnecessarily. Don't give a program more information than it needs. Anonymize where possible. So for example, under GDPR rules, anonymized information isn't personal information. So some kind of best practices there. The one difference that you want to understand with AI models is, are the prompts training the model? And in some cases, the answer will be yes. In some cases, the answer will be no. So for example, today, chat GPT prompts train the model. They use the prompts that people submit to make that model better. So that changes the type of stuff you would want to put in there. But the GPT API, that is how developers use that same language model right now, Prompts sent through there do not train the model. So that that API call is genuinely just, it's it's no different than making an API call to an accounting system. There's no aspect of retention of information there. So kind of like all the other apps that we use, you got to do some due diligence on, on what does data retention look like, keeping plugged into those policies and making sure that that data is, is not going anywhere that it shouldn't go. And, you know, the, the value add that we provide that Jason mentioned is, you know, you could throw a complex question into one of these models and get back a response. But if you haven't asked it all of the right questions, you're going to be missing a lot of the context that you need to complete the analysis and to, you know, um, give your client the right advice in, in this particular circumstance. So context, I think, is really important. And just to reiterate Jason's point about accuracy you still have to verify the accuracy of the the information that's being produced through the model. Well, Lisa, that's a great segue here uh, because you know this, it, like many other technologies, uh, it's about how you manage it, and that's what the clients are looking for firms to do is to help them manage complexity, help provide them advice. And I, I'll tell you, a lot of people right now are saying, "Wow, this is this is complex." Everybody's going to start getting their arms around it more and more. But let's just kind of share. And I say, say this is going to be a continuing discussion with the town hall uh, community. But Jason, let's leave them with a few takeaways. Yeah, it's it's you know too early to say for sure all the ways AI will impact us. But best practices honestly aren't too different than best practices with past tech changes we've seen. Mm -hmm. Always be looking for greater specificity in what you do. The more general the work, that's that's going to be the stuff that's automated quickest. Think about product leadership, your tech partners. It's, it's, it's fair to ask questions of them. How are you leaning into AI? How will this impact the way that we work with our apps? 
But then ultimately, I mean, if you really want to turn this narrative on its head with your clients and the way that you work, just learn about it. You know, just like anything else, become an expert in it. Everybody's being impacted like this, just like we are in our profession. And if you can actually then spin that into an advisory opportunity where, where you're actually helping clients better understand this stuff and show that you're actually leaning into it, then I think you really, you really mitigate the risk of, of ever being displaced by something like this. And I'll just add to that, go have some fun with it right now um, and just play around in, in the sandbox. Ask it you know, to help you write a blog about something and continue to refine your prompts. That's something I've learned from watching Jason um, do that on, on his videos is ask it a different question, ask it the right tone. Just go have some fun with it for now. Um, and it's gonna develop to Jason's point pr probably pretty quickly but keep an open mindset and go go play around, have some fun right now. Yeah, I mean, at Digital CPA, we did that. We did that with Aaron Harris on stage. Aaron asked it to write a few poems and wrote, it, it did a great job with that. I think just, you know, when you broadly, the top comment we have here, AI won't replace accountants, accounts leveraging AI will repl re replace accounts not leveraging AI. Jason's points here of, you know, it's gonna continue to drive, you know, additional specialization without a doubt. And and the reason when you think about that is because, you know, one of the fundamental value drivers of of the accounting and profession is the outsourcing of these tasks from a business to to the accountant. And they're outsourcing things. And then when you outsource things, you're always looking for greater and greater specialists where the business wants to focus on their business and they want, you know, someone to help them with their finances, help them with a lot of advisory type of decisions. And if you we just finished tax season, if you look at the do-it-yourself tax market, that is flat in many ways. And the growing market is assisted tax. And it could be assisted tax with some AI input or obviously with 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 CPAs. So I think this is just another, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an exciting time. And it, this one does feel different though, Jason, in some ways. I think this is a like blockchain, I remember blockchain, it came out, I was, I was, you know, seven years ago with, at a conference, people said, hey, just, it's just time to wrap up the accounting firm, there'll be no more audits. Well, yeah. look at this. I mean, it has not replaced the audit function. So yeah. Yeah, it's hard to delineate between kind of those, those past things. But this one, it is different, I think, in that it's faster. And so the like, if you can maintain agility and keep plugged into what's happening, I think you'll, I think you'll be just fine.